Good morning, everyone, and good afternoon to those on the East Coast. My name is Priyanka Kohli, and on behalf of Slow Money Northern California, I am so pleased and honored to welcome you all to Food Funded 2021, the Jedi Edition, as well as the Food Investor Fair. Let me introduce our first panel for today that will be sharing their insights on the very important topic of building villages, community as a support system for Jedi. And leading this discussion are esteemed panelists, Diana Tremley of ICA, Anthony Chang from Kitchen Table Advisors, and Ashani DeGray from Community Copac in Oregon. Through her work as a Chief Program Officer at ICA, Diana is building an ecosystem to level the playing field by providing and supporting the entrepreneurs of color with equitable access to business strategy, coaching, and capital fundraising and network building. Anthony is a friend who has shaped Kitchen Table Advisors, where he worked on funding for small farms and ranches, many of them run by immigrants. He is a son of immigrant small business owners himself. Ashani is an experienced first Ashani has experienced firsthand the innate challenges as a black indigenous person of color founder launching his own gourmet Caribbean sauce. He is now focused on building the community co-pack in Oregon, a food hub that will serve as a holistic partner for the budding BIPOC entrepreneurs without the high cost barriers of the traditional co-packers. I am so excited to welcome them all and would like to get started by asking Diana to ground us on what sort of villages and communities can the BIPOC entrepreneurs tap into. Diana? Hi, thanks for having me. Good morning, everyone. Um, there are so many, but I think first it's uh, recognizing that, you know, entrep BIPOC entrepreneurs, each of them are very unique and different and special. And when we think about the word BIPOC, smushing everyone together, there's a loss of identity. So I first want to say that it's, you know, supporting a Black entrepreneur is different than supporting an Indigenous entrepreneur, which is important, different from supporting a, a Latinx entrepreneur. And there are so many communities that um, folks don't know they have access to. One is your own community, but then there's communities like ICA, Kitchen Table Advisors as well. And really thinking about how do you support companies and how do you support entrepreneurs to really think about um, their business. And really, it's it's not that we're teaching anything. Communities don't teach each other anything. You learn from each other and you help to unlock the knowledge and wisdom that are already innate in so many people. But that's been smushed down because of the systemic racism in our country and just the different systems that we have. So, um, you know, capital ecosystems are really important, but not just debt, but getting equity out there into the world, too, um, and in smaller amounts. Um, and you might say like folks might not need smaller amounts of equity, but if you're uh, one year in business, um, equity can do so much for your business than, than debt. Debt is important as well, but equity is, is equally important. Um, and then there's just the community that you can um, get access to through doing programs. Uh, like we run accelerators and we just graduated an 11 person cohort and they created their own amazing community. We're done with the programming and they're still hanging out with each other. They have a Facebook group. Um, they are trying to get together to do things in person, socially distanced, of course. So there's lots of communities um, and it's really just tapping into um, the different communities that you have in your own area. But also it's like, how do you find them? You find them at events like this. You find them at just different ways. And uh, it's our job as ecosystem builders to make sure that folks have access and we're reaching out to as many people as possible so they know what the communities are that they can have access to. Well, that was great insight, Diana. And um, Anthony, would you, or Ashani, would you like to chime in as well? Um, yeah, I'll chime in. Um, hello, everybody. Um, Ashani DeGru, glad to be here. Um, yeah, I'm really, I'm really interested in this. Um, I'm new to this ecosystem development. Um, I'm, I've been a chef for most of my career. But I think right now is like with this organization, it's like tapping in, like, she, like Diana said, tapping into the already existing, like, kind of vibrant 
food community ecosystem in Portland and just really trying to um, utilize that as much as possible for the makers and give them access and give them access to resources and information is really the biggest barriers I see of the community that serve. And I can uh, jump into Anthony Chang, he, him, kitchen table advisors. Um, there's a couple things I want to say. I know there's a there's entrepreneurs that are here as well as impact investors or lenders and such. They're part of the you know, food funded slow money Cal Northern California community. And I kind of want to speak to both of those audiences. Um, you know, on the first on the entrepreneurs, just like so much in terms of relationship. Um, and I think Diana and Ashani have kind of talked to some of the, like, you know, people and organizations and leaders and such and kind of like, I feel like so much of our work that we do with farmers and ranchers happens through relationship, not kind of like anonymously through a bank, not anonymously through a website, but it's like sitting down with folks and being able to kind of in pre post COVID like share meals and things like that and just kind of leaning into um, building relationships, um, is something that I kind of want to offer. And I think that, you know, spaces like this can offer a richness there. Um, and also want to speak to the investors um, in the room. And like, you know, coming into this conversation, I have like lots of questions around justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. And like, what are you all actually trying to get to? And is it really all four of those things? I see the inclusion, I see diversity in terms of like, maybe y'all like want to be able to work with finance, support more um, people of color, more black folk, more black business owners, indigenous business owners, other people of color, um, et cetera. Um, but are you working on equity in terms of equitable access to information, to relationships, to financing? Are you working on non-extractive forms of finance? How are you building with folks how are you following the lead of communities of color um, instead of just kind of imposing your own expectations and what you've kind of like what we've all been socialized in terms of financial mainstream and then like if we're really talking about justice or if you really want to lean into justice like are we talking about questioning capitalism are we like really acknowledging kind of the history of this country in terms of the theft of indigenous land the enslavement of african peoples and kind of the reparations that and land back that's needed to even like begin a conversation about justice um, and so I just like, you know, this conversation might focus on kind of the incremental changes that we can work on today on inclusion, diversity, and maybe equity, but like don't want to lose the forest for the trees in this conversation as well. For sure. And I think, um, I think, Anthony, that's a really good point of not losing the forest through the trees. And I think, um, you know, we talked about this a little bit this week, last week. I don't know what day that was. I have no idea what day it is anymore. Um, but we talked a little bit about um, incremental change is really, it's like, it's needed to make sure that we folks are getting what they need. And it's uh, each of our organizations, we do, we do that, but we are also trying to systemically change a lot of things too. And when you think about ecosystem and access, it's like, you know, I'm interested of the entrepreneurs who are, who are here right now, like what's needed? What do you need? How can we make sure that you, you get that to you? Um, because, you know, my organization works with, you know, folks, the nine county Bay area. So that's 101 cities, but it's like, what else, what else is needed? And, you know, Ashan, Ashani is in Portland, Portland. Portland. So it's like, well, what, do, what do people need? And I think, you know, we can then make sure that we get you what you need for sure. Cause I know that we're all dedicated to doing that. Um, and, you know, around justice, I think justice, I think of the Jedi is it, it is, it is one of the harder pieces to tackle and deal with because it is such large things, but there are different things that each of us can do, um, even in the business, in, even in your own business that you can do to reflect that as well. I don't know what uh, Anthony and Ashani think about that. I mean, yeah, I feel that, I feel that a lot of the, the justice part has to be, um, restorative justice needs to be added into that. So we have to like take into account the historic um, damage and, and trauma that's in harm that's been done to certain groups. So. Keeping that in mind is is definitely is definitely interesting in um, investing and in being the entrepreneur. It's like you have to be keep in mind like where you're at and who is actually trying to help you and who's trying to use you for additional financing for some other purpose and kind of co-opt your mission. So uh, yeah. Building on what you all are saying, um, Diana and Ashani, I, feel, I really appreciate what you're saying about the need um, piece of it. And I feel like wanting to add on to that around like I think there's and, and this is hard to do in practice given all that we're holding and juggling but like 
imagining what you as entrepreneurs, what you all really need and articulating that, even when the conventional financial mainstream institutions like don't offer what you actually need. Like you can like recognize the real practical reality of like you may want X, but what like folks can offer you is Y, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you don't like think about X or like actually ask for X and force people to consider um, offering X instead of Y. And I feel like that's like speaking to the need and, you know, again, like difficult to hold all the things all the time. Um, and, you know, I'm seeing some really beautiful things where communities of entrepreneurs, communities of social entrepreneurs, communities of farmers that are responding to the needs that they and their community have by building their own tables and not only responding to the tables that already exist. You know, folks, one example that comes to mind is Black Farmer Fund in the, in the Northeast, where there are Black folks coming together with Black-owned food businesses and farms that are setting the table in terms of who gets funding and what are the terms of that funding. And so, like, you know, it's again, it's, it's, it's a stretch, it's a reach, it's like there's so much, like, barriers to that while you are starting and running your businesses, but, like, kind of, again, the forest for the trees. And, like, on the flip side to the investors in the room, like, what are, I want to ask the question, what are you all doing if you're really focused on the whole spectrum of inclusion, diversity, equity, and justice, like what are you doing to actually give up power and really meet the needs of folks, um, the entrepreneurs that, that are in this room and letting them set the table on the terms and expectations and how are, and there's incremental things on like lower the amount of financial return, de-emphasize financial return, take more risk, actually build relationships with the communities of color, actually have people, if you don't already have people of color from those communities on your teams making those decisions, there's all sorts of incremental things along this path, like communities actually governing and stewarding their own capital. Yeah, sorry, my lights in my office just went off because I wasn't moving around enough. Um, <laughs> so you get you get this light for me. Um, I think also like in thinking about investing, like realizing that um, entrepreneurs of color and that's across all I'm saying non-white entrepreneurs are not more risky to invest in. And you know, you don't invest in entrepreneurs of color like not doing that is an issue, not because you're missing out on opportunity, but because it's a social imperative. It is the part, it is, it is justice, it is restorative economics, it is making sure that you're actually doing the things that you set out to do. And are your underwriting criteria the same? Are you asking the same sets of questions? Are you asking your entrepreneurs of color, especially your black entrepreneurs for more information? And so they have to prove that they know how to do the things. And black entrepreneurs are always asked for way more proof that they can do something and carry something than anyone else. Um, so it's like, as an investor, what are you doing to make sure that you are following um, and thinking about Jedi? And the Jedi Collaborative has amazing tools on their website to begin a Jedi journey. Self-directed, you can do it. Um, and there are amazing tools for investors on there too. Um, if you're thinking about how do I start, then you can go to that website and you can start as soon as this conference is over today too. Um, my personal journey as an entrepreneur, um, which made which led me to start to help co-found Community Co Back, was I started my business and I realized there was no resources for someone that looked like me, and I was a big gap in in resources and information. And I, I ended up having to, as a black entrepreneur, I had to end up going and getting an internship at the FIC Food Innovation Center. I had to go through all these extra steps just to get on the same playing field. It's like, I feel I had to go above and beyond, but at the same time, it's a benefit, but it's an extra pressure that the POC entrepreneur has to go through. And it's definitely a pressure. And, and, you, and then we feel it as entrepreneurs, for sure. And I'm gonna layer on a few things there too. You know, at Kitchen Table Advisors, we work a lot with farmers of color, women farmers, queer farmers. Um, we do a lot of work with the Latino immigrant organic farmers so down in Salinas and Watsonville, Hollister, kind of an hour or two south of, of San Francisco um, and Oakland. And it's like, there are pieces around, you know, Diana and, and Ashani, what you're saying about kind of identity background, the additional layers of barriers and challenges. And then there's also, like for non-native English speakers, there's language for rural communities, there's like internet access um, and just kind of like cultural understanding um, and just kind of, yeah, and cultural understanding and cultural norms. Um, and again, um, apologies if I'm speaking like too much to the investors in the room and not enough to the entrepreneurs in the room, but just like, you know, just thinking about like, what are, what are, what are you all, what are we doing collectively to like actually meet people where they're at? 
and not make people jump through the hoops that you that we become accustomed to just because that's what they are or that's because what what someone's cultural norm is how do we design things that are you know respect people's culture or language um and that are like really designed for them like we're talking in our board meetings at kitchen table badges is like a random example but like we work with so many latino immigrant um organic farmers half of our board is now latino um and we're like why are board meetings not in spanish or english and in spanish um like one of our board members is like we need to be going to where the expertise is and so much of that expertise is being held by latina immigrant farmers and like most of the ones we work with are made are monolingual spanish speakers non-native english speakers and like we're like locking them out of this conversation because our board meetings have been in english and to speak to the entrepreneur i think i think as a poc entrepreneur we end up undervaluing what we're doing because we're trying to like fit in a system that's not like made for us to fit in. So we just, so our, our initial reaction to the entrepreneur is like, let's just try to get the investment. And then at the same time, we short ourselves in the process and undervalue what we're giving. So I would say just make sure that you um, hold some value in, in what you're serving. What you're serving. Yeah. And I, like, I, I will add to that because what you are building is valuable. Like it, there's the opportunity you have the smarts to do it. Like it, it's all valuable and thinking about what's that long-term value that you can create over time. Um, and really thinking about, as you think about, you know, how do you pull forward um, just your ideals and the Jedi principles as, a, as the entrepreneur, as you're running your business, it's like, what are the opportunities are you giving to your employees? Um, I know at ICA, we think a lot about wealth creation and not just wealth creation for the entrepreneur and the shareholders, but for the employees, the employees should be shareholders too. Um, and by being able to build those principles in, it is um, directly influenced and directly addressing some of the principles of Jedi as you think about as I build my business. And of course, if you know, you're, you're just starting, you don't even have enough money to pay yourself, but think about it in the long term. First, how do you pay yourself? And then how do you build wealth for yourself? And as you're bringing on folks, how do you help to help your employees and your community build wealth over time too? Ashani and Diana, what you both just shared like makes me think of the, a couple different questions around kind of like the holding of the both and. Um, Ashani, it's just like you're saying kind of like as a person of color, kind of like as a business owner trying to like navigate these systems like like how to do, how to fit into, <laughs> fit into a box um, while still, I don't know, staying true to yourself perhaps, as well as um, what you're saying, Diana, about like how to hold that, I think someone mentioned that in the chat too, of how to like, how do I like build my business and like actually pay myself a living wage and support employees, et cetera. I'm wondering if like, if either of you have like practical advice on how to actually do that for folks that are in the room yeah and for the investors i think you have to really be mindful it's like sometimes you have to with, with plc entrepreneurs you have to build capacity you have to leave room for capacity building because it's not like a lot of the traditional things that are, that, um, are expected of the entrepreneur we are kind of behind on some of those things and, and financial things and, and and understanding so Capacity building you know, on both sides, investor and entrepreneur, I think, keeping that in mind that it, it needs to be a, a, a growth for both people at the same time. And I think it's capacity building 100%. And I even think about um, as you're growing your business, knowing that you don't have to wear all hats, not everything needs to be absolutely perfect. It's fine to be fine. It's fine to be okay. It's fine to go out and ask for help. It's fine to find the different people who can help you. And I think it's, you know, as a black woman, especially as you think about if you're a black female entrepreneur as well, or even any entrepreneur of color, we oftentimes get real bad advice from people who are just trying to be helpful. They're really well-intentioned, but it's bad advice. It's bad. So it's like find those circles and those places that can be trusted. And usually your other entrepreneur friends can tell you that, or if you're the first entrepreneur in your family or in your group of friends, um, find organizations like, you know, I can put my email in the, in the chat. Like I will, like, I know organizations around the country, all of us do, we can share what we know and we can share those different resources. 
And I think also tactically, and this is for investors is, and I said this at the top, it's like the different types of capital that we are offering. So at ICA, we're doing a micro equity product this year. It's the first time we're doing it. It's 25 to $50,000 of equity investments in companies who go through our early stage accelerator. Um, and the reason we did that is because we were seeing that entrepreneurs of color, especially black entrepreneurs were having such a hard time getting access to equity from institutions, um, let alone like, where are you gonna find an angel investor if you don't already know one? And if your network doesn't have that, um, so we created this product so that we can then invest in companies so that their path to getting to a million, at least a million dollars in revenue. And in that path, you're able to pay yourself. You're able to not do everything by yourself. You're able to hire some sort of help. We want to make sure that we are getting in there earlier and doing earlier intervention. It's not even intervention. It's we're taking a bed earlier because we believe in the companies that we work with. So I think it's thinking creatively around capital um, and thinking creatively around um, risk. It's perceived risk and there's real risk. Small businesses are always perceived as risky. Small businesses run by people of color are seen, like perceived as even more risky. And like I said before, they're not. So I think practically it's looking and seeing what kind of capital is out there, looking to seeing what kind of support is out there. And if you're not sure, you know, just you can Google ICA. We have a form on our website that you can get in contact with us and we will share all the resources we can. And I know there's so many other folks on this call in, in, in the conference today that are so willing to share resources too. Ashani, there was a question in the chat for you. Oh, there was. Uh, yeah. Um, what did you see happen in Portland that made you start a co-packer? Um, well, what, what I saw was um, really the co-packers in Portland have so many inquiries and they, they have so many choices. So they choose to work with the people who is easiest to work with and the people that fit their systems. And they pretty much are holding, the, they're the gatekeepers for getting your, having your product in a situation as an entrepreneur that you can actually grow your business and have someone else pack you with your, your, your products. But at the same time, the minimums are so high, they want you to make two, two, three pallets at a time. They want you to, you know, they want you to have a certain type of methods and certain products. So it's like, I saw that there was a, a hole for people like me who want to make an artisan product, small batch, trying to make really quality, quality products. And there's just, there was just no co-packer that's willing to like meet the entrepreneur where they're at. And that's why, that's why we kind of got together and like decided to make a, a wraparound services and actually get, make the entrepreneur feel like they're they're supported, they have the resources and they can actually move forward and grow the business. Ashani, as you share that story, I'm curious kind of like what has been important kind of key for you in, so, I mean, you're like, do, you're building a business that's supporting other businesses, but for you as an entrepreneur, kind of like what has been key, who has been key and kind of along the way for you? Um, for me, it's been really like um, building bridges and, and, and creating things that weren't there. Like um, the FIC, I'm the first black fellow at the FIC, Food Innovation Center, um, Oregon State Food Innovation Center. It's like contact the director. I found out like the, the networks and pathways that are currently there aren't helpful to me. So I had to like contact people and put myself out there and be like, listen, I have these skills and I, and I, I want to know this information and I volunteer my time to find out. So it's like, you know, it's, it's really, it's really just like keep inching forward. And as far as my product, my product and the co-packer, I have kind of been like growing synonymously. So like in the process of me trying to help my, help my, help myself by helping my community, it's, it's really, it's really doing both well at the same time. And then Anthony, I'm curious of, um, you know, with everything that happened in the last 18 months, what um, resources, like what are you seeing and what are you seeing with the folks that you're working with and what did you have to change and how you're supporting folks? Yeah, thanks for that question, Diana. I mean, I think that there's a piece of what we do at Congenital Advisors of just like, um, my, my colleague, David Mancera, who leads our work in Salinas, like in the first few weeks of COVID and kind of shut down and such, he like calmed the team down by saying, just like, hey, y'all, this is like actually what we do. 
we help entrepreneurs, we help farmers when they're facing crisis and help them navigate from a business and financial perspective. And so it's like, yes, the, like it's a heightened situation and there's more people calling us right now, but this is what we do. Um, and I think that was, um, I think the importance of the work that ICA does of other organizations that are providing technical assistance, particularly to, in communities of color and particularly those that come from communities of color, like been so important in this time. And I think from a capital perspective, like, just, I don't think it's gone as far as I would like that we would like from in terms of reimagining how capital, how people think about capital and deploying that capital and the risk of that capital, but seeing some kind of incremental change towards there's some efforts to put more money into um, funds that are governed and stewarded by communities of color on the ground. Um, there's more kind of just grant capital available to businesses. We helped through a collaborative stand up the California BIPOC Farmer Land Steward Relief Fund and moved almost a million dollars to black indigenous POC farmers and land stewards, right? That was needed in response to COVID. And then there's also kind of like, what does the recovery look like? And the more, more I, I mean, we're still waiting for some of this capital to actually like follow through and what they say they wanna do. But in terms of activating impact investor capital, DAF capital, recoverable grants, straight grants to entrepreneurs that are doing really incredible work on the ground, whether like because of the work they're doing on the ground or from a racial justice lens or combination of those things, I think there's huge opportunities for, um, for investors and for philanthropic institutions to just like think about capital differently, not only where it goes and who receives it, but like what are the terms of that capital and willing to like go much further in actually supporting the impact and not um, worrying so much about the preservation of capital and financial return. Thank you so much. This was such a wonderful and a motivating discussion. A big thank you to all the wonderful panelists, especially for your willingness to share freely the resources and to help out and support our entrepreneurs.